Welcome to the Farm Gened, Bridging the Gap Between Science and Practice, Train the Trainer Session for Psychiatry 1 on Depression. Today is Thursday, October 21, 2010. This presentation is supported by a grant by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Today's agenda includes an overview of the PharmGenet program, review of the educational content in Psychiatry 1 on depression, future webinar dates, contact information, survey instruments, and a question and answer session. All copyrighted content included within this presentation has been granted copyright permission. The overall objective of the pharmacogenomics education program, Bridging the Gap Between Science and Practice, is an evidence-based pharmacogenomics education program designed for pharmacists and physicians, pharmacy and medical students, and other healthcare professionals. The overall objective of the PharmGenet program is to increase awareness about current knowledge of the validity and utility of pharmacogenomic tests and the potential implications of benefits and harms from use of these tests. We have the following educational modules available as part of the shared curriculum for faculty. The webinar dates for these sessions will be provided at the end of this presentation. In the following discussions of each therapeutic area and the pertinent pharmacogenomic test, the information will be presented in the following format. The gene and or allele of interest, functional effects of the gene and or allele, prevalence rates of the gene and or allele in different populations, available genomic tests, summary of the most clinical, um, significant clinical data available to date, and this information is further categorized in the literature that affect dosing or drug selection, those that affect efficacy, and those that affect toxicity. And finally, recommendation for genomic testing from reputable agencies or national guidelines. At this time, I'd like to introduce the author for Psychiatry 1 Depression. Dr. Vicki Ellingrod is a Associate Professor of Clinical, Social, and Administrative Sciences in the College of Pharmacy, the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine, and Director of the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Laboratory at the University of Michigan. She received a BS in Pharmacy and PharmD from the University of Minnesota and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in Psychopharmacology and Pharmacogenetics at the University of Iowa. She was previously a faculty member at the University of Iowa and received a KOA training grant funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. In 2006, she joined the faculty at the University of Michigan, and her research focuses on the pharmacogenomics of mental health treatment, specifically the metabolic complications seen with antipsychotic use and schizophrenia. She continues to receive research support from the NIMH, as well as an indep independent investigator award for the National Alliance for Research in Schizophrenia and Depression. Dr. Engelrod. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, today we're going to start out by going some, over some learning objectives, um, and I think these are pretty similar to most of these uh, webinars in that um, the goal of this is to identify the specific drug therapies in which pharmacogenetic testing can be applied in the clinical setting, summarize evidence-based recommendations for pharmacogenetic testing, and then we're going to go over a case in pace, uh, a case in patient case uh, to formulate a plan for pharmacogenetic testing based on uh, the available scientific literature. So to start off with today, I realize that not everyone in this call might um, have a, a psych background, and so what we're really going to be talking about today are antidepressant medications. And these actually um, are primarily used for major depressive disorder and then other anxiety disorders as well. Um, specifically in there is obsessive compulsive disorder where they're often used in higher um, dosage forms, although that is um, an anxiety disorder. So in terms of the pharmacogenomic studies that we have, we really don't have a lot, um, but, but what they've focused on is primarily major depressive disorder. Um, there's been a couple large uh, trials recently where um, pharmacogenomics was not necessarily the reason for the study, but it was added on, and so that's where we have uh, most of the evidence in terms of antidepressant response. Um, we'll also be talking about this a little bit later, but side effects um, in relation to antidepressant use has also been studied pharmacogenetically, looking at just 
overall medication intolerance, sexual dysfunction, as well as some of the gastrointestinal sort of side effects, the nausea and vomiting um, that you can see with antidepressant medications. So to start off with, we're going to go to the patient case. Um, this is a 25-year-old African-American female student who's being referred to the clinic by her faculty advisor after requesting to leave school. And at this point, her chief complaint is that she's sad and she just can't do it anymore, um, which, you know, a lot of graduate students tend to feel that way. But uh, it was severe enough that they, that they brought her into the clinic. So vitals, uh, her weight is 68 kilos, height 5 feet 8 inches, uh, blood pressure 108 over 70, and heart rate 68. So a very physically healthy 25-year-old um, student. For her history of present illness over the last three months, she's reported a, a depressed mood, loss of interest in usual activities, low energy, poor sleep. She has past thoughts about killing herself, but does currently does not have any suicidal ideation. And she goes on to get a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And this is a clinic that uses um, some standardized rating scale. And so the one that they used is the Hamilton rating scale for depression, or the HAMD. And her score at the clinic visit was 20. And so usually depression is uh, manifested by the depressed mood, the loss and in interest of usual activities, the low energy, poor sleep. Um, and because she has had a past history of suicidal ideation, that would tend to make you think that, that this, is, this is a pretty severe depression and that, yes, it needs to be treated. It's, it's not a sort of wait and see um, sort of depression or one that would just um, respond to psychotherapy alone. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the rating scales that we use in psychiatry, um, like I said, the HAMD is the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression. Um, it's also abbreviated the HRSD um, uh, in addition to the HAMD. It's a standardized multiple choice questionnaire that clinicians use to rate the severity of the patient's depressive symptoms. Um, it traditionally has about 17 questions to it, although there are other scales that go up to 21 or more questions. And oftentimes you'll see a HAMD slash 17 or a HAMD slash 21, and that tells you how many um, questions are on it. It really is considered the gold standard for rating depression. Um, each of the 17 items or 21 items has um, between three to five possible responses, which increase in severity. So the higher your score, the more severe your depressive symptoms are. Uh, the maximum uh, available score on the HAMD-17 is 54, and usually if people have a score greater than 15, it's pretty indicative of depressive symptoms, and a score of 20 is, is pretty indicative of, of moderate to uh, severe um, depressions or symptoms associated with depression. Um, there's other uh, rating scales that can get used um, for depression, the Montgomery Asberg Depression Scale or the Mad Madras. Um, the, Deprec, the BAC Depression Inventory, or the BDI, are oftentimes just called the BAC. The Zong Self-Rating uh, Depression Scale, or the Zong. And then one that's becoming more common now is the Quick Inventory of Depressive Symptomatology, or the QUIDS. And so uh, as you're looking through the literature, those are certain rating scales that uh, you may find. Um, so like I said before, she has, pr uh, she has moderate to severe depression um, in that past. Uh, thoughts about killing herself are really what would um, make someone think that this, this person really needs to be treated with pharmacotherapy. So family history, always important to ask when you're treating someone with psychiatric illness because one of the best indicators of success with treatment is a, a family member who's also been successfully treated. Um, so her mother is currently being treated for depression, although she doesn't know what medication name, and that's usually what you see, uh, so it doesn't help you all that much, but she does state that many people in her family are sensitive to medications, and this is going to be kind of key as we go on um, with this case. The decision is made to treat her with paroxetine, um, and she's given 20 milligrams a day, um, and after eight weeks, she's doing much better. Hamilton depression scale has, has decreased. It's almost down by 50 percent. It's now 12, meaning she still has some depressive symptomatology. Um, she has six significant sexual dysfunction, which is very common with the SSRIs, um, and she asks if there's really anything that can be done about it. So um, one of the keys that I talked about is that she has a first-degree relative who's being treated for depression. Um, there's a genetic component uh, in developing depression as well as uh, treatment outcomes. So since many people in her family are sensitive to medications, this may mean um, that there is some uh, drug metabolism 
um, reduction going on, pro probably through cytochrome P450 2D6. So she may have some 2D6 poor metabolizers in her family. Um, given the fact that the 2D6 poor metabolism follows Mendelian genetics, the chances that she's an intermediate metabolizer is going to be 100% if her parents are poor metabolizers. Um, and if one of her parents is an intermediate metabolizer, meaning they only have one non-functional allele, she has a 50% chance of being an intermediate metabolizer. So at this point, we really don't know what is going on. And, and clinically, in practice, uh, pharmacogenetic testing isn't, isn't really being done, but this is the type of patient when it probably should be done. Um, we have a couple algorithms out there. There's the Texas Medication Algorithm Project, or TMAP, as well as the Sequence Treatment Alternatives to Relieve Depression, um, which the acronym for that is the STAR-D. Um, and at this point, because she has responded fairly well to this medication, but she um, is not in remission, the recommendations then are to augment her with something else um, instead of switching to another medication, because if we would switch, then she would need to have um, another uh, 8 to 12 weeks of treatment. So our goal is to get her HAMD score down to less than 10 um, and to get rid of the side effects that she uh, currently has. Um, she also states that since she's doing so well in the paroxetine, she doesn't want to discontinue it, and so the decision is made based on the recommendations and what she talks about. Um, adding 150 milligrams a day of bupropion or Wellbutrin. Now, bupropion is kind of interesting in that um, it, it works pharmacologically different than the paroxetine, and so there's, there's several studies out there that have looked at using it as an add-on therapy for people that have significant sexual dysfunction um, with their SSRIs. And so the 150 milligrams a day um, is used, and after three weeks of treatment, she complains that actually her sexual dysfunction has become a lot worse. Um, and she's also having nausea now, and that her depressive symptoms um, may also be getting worse. And so the question is, why is this happening given that, you know, we're putting her on an, an additional medication that's supposed to help with the sexual dysfunction? And although bupropion may have some nausea and vomiting associated with it, after three weeks you would expect that that would be gone um, related to its use. And so something else um, is going on here. Um, and so we, we need to think about that as we go through this case. So nine weeks after starting the paroxetine and bupropion treatment, they're both discontinued. Um, and so the question is, why would her sexual dysfunction and nausea get worse? Um, and that's really at the, at the crux of this case. And so paroxetine is metabolized by 2D6. Um, and bupropion is actually an inhibitor of 2D6. And so what happened is, because she's a possibly an immediate or, or, or potentially a poor metabolizer, we don't know that yet, um, most likely an intermediate metabolizer, the little uh, 2D6 enzyme that she has is now being inhibited by bupropion, and so she's getting much higher levels of the paroxetine, leading to the increase in side effects. Much, And so the sexual dysfunction is getting worse because her paroxetine levels are much higher. Um, compared to what they were before. Even though we've added on the bupropion, which is supposed to help with the sexual dysfunction, the increase in the paroxetine concentration that it's caused is actually overcoming uh, any beneficial effect that the bupropion may have. And so, you know, that's, that's really what, it, it, behind the case, that would be part of the discussion that you would um, start having on a couple of these slides as to why her side effects um, would be getting worse or not. And so based on this case, then, you know, we, she still has depression that is not um, completely um, resolved. Uh, last we checked, her HAMD was 12, although she said her depressive symptoms um, were worse. And so the decision is made to start venlafaxine since it has a different mechanism of action um, for bupropion or paroxetine. So six weeks after she starts the venlafaxine, there's still no improvement. Her HAMD is now up to 15. She's very frustrated as to why um, she's undergoing these treatments for depression and, and nothing seems to be working. And so the decision is made to, to genotype her for the CYP2D6 enzyme because she has this family history of people being very sensitive to medications. And sure enough, the test results show that she's an intermediate metabolizer. And so our hypothesis is kind of proven correct that the bupropion was inhibiting the 2D6, causing increases in the paroxetine concentration. Um, and we weren't getting any benef beneficial effects from the bupropion in terms of sexual um, dysfunction. 
So the venlafaxine is discontinued because she's been on it, you know, six weeks. She's not seeing any improvement, um, and she started on citalopram, <coughs> and uh, eventually goes into remission. And those, there's no recurrence of sexual dysfunction. And the reason that the citalopram is chosen is because that's not inhibited by 2D6 and it's not metabolized um, by 2D6, and so you don't have the drug interactions associated with it. <coughs> So, you know, as I've given this webinar, I've, I've kind of given you a lot of the thoughts that, that we've had in putting this case together. And so at this point, you would have um, questions that were related to the case that you, you wouldn't have necessarily shared all those thoughts um, with the students that are listening. And so the, the questions then you would have for the students are given what we know, given that we now know she's a 2D6 intermediate metabolizer, does it explain anything in her past treatment? And this is where you would explain um, what we just talked about with the bupropion inhibiting the 2D6 and her being an intermediate metabolizer. And then hopefully you can get a discussion um, going with the group. If, if we had had this information at the beginning of treatment, how might it have changed practice in the patient's response? And most likely, um, if someone is an intermediate metabolizer, either the bupropion would not have been added on or um, she would have been started on citalopram right away since you don't have the drug interactions um, with, the, with the 2D6. And so those are things that you would want then the students to talk about or to think about as this, as this case goes on, because we will visit the case again at the end to summarize it. So as we look at, as we look at the treatment of depression, um, the antidepressants really can be classified into about five different groups. And really, all of these groups are based on similar pharmacology. So the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors work through serotonin. Serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitors work through serotonin norepinephrine. Tricyclics pretty much work on all of the neurotransmitters. The same with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, and then there's some miscellaneous ones that don't really fit into these broad categories, such as trazodone, nifazidone, mirtazapine, and bupropion. And bupropion is the one that's a little bit different than the others in that it, it has more dopamine activity. Um, uh, than the other antidepressants. So as we look at how we treat depression, there's some stages that um, are recommended, and this is from the Texas Medication Algorithm, or the TMAP. Um, the first stage of the algorithm is an assessment and discussion, um, which would ensue involving the patient with the decision-making process. Um, it would also include a discussion of non-pharmacologic options that are available and the evidence that supports their use. And like I said, in this case, given her past um, suicidal thoughts, this would be a case where you could say, well, there, there are some non-pharmacologic treatments available, but uh, quite frankly, I think, I think you're going to need a medication because you have pretty severe depression. Although a uh, combination of non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic is probably the best and, and should be encouraged. Um, Stage one, then, is starting medication for the treatment of depression. The treatment and the decision um, are then guided by the patient's response after four to six weeks of treatment. It may take some people up to 12 weeks before they really start seeing response um, to treatment. If they're a non-responder during this time, then you would consider switching them um, to another class of antidepressant. But if they're a partial responder where they've had uh, some reduction in their HAMD or, or whatever standardized rating scale, um, but they are not below that uh, remission threshold, then you would consider augmenting with an additional agent um, unless someone wants to switch to another um, agent, which is, which is also fairly common. So in our case, since the subject experienced a partial response with paroxetine and she didn't want to be taken off of it, um, the de decision was made to augment with bupropion. And then, like I've talked about, evidence in the literature really suggests that, that this medication may have a different mechanism of action and a low incidence of sexual dysfunction and can be used as an augmentation strategy. <coughs> so as we look at the pharmacogenomics of antidepressants, these also very broadly can be divided up into pharmacodynamic effects as well as pharmacokinetic effects. And we're going to talk about some of the pharmacodynamic effects first. And really, this has to do with anything that, that isn't associated with drug metabolism. Um, so these are variants that are associated with response, whether they're directly related to the pharmacology of the medication itself or whether they're related to some other biological component of depression. Um, in terms of pharmacokinetic effects, we're looking at primarily drug metabolism. So it's really the cytochrome P450s or the drug 
um, transporters like P glycoprotein, uh, which is a product of the multi drug resistance gene one, um, that we would discuss as we're talking about the pharmacokinetic component. So we talked a little bit about antidepressant pharmacology, but um, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine um, are, are the primary um, neurotransmitters that we're looking at. And if we group this a little bit differently, the SSRIs, SNR, SNRIs, and tricyclics all block the reuptake of serotonin through the serotonin transporter. And so serotonin transporter is, is one of our pharmacodynamic targets that we look at. Um, in terms of norepinephrine reuptake, tricyclics and SNRIs have an effect there. And we talked about um, dopamine with uh, bupropion and potentially sertraline as well. Um, MAOIs, because of their mechanism of action blocking the monoamine oxidase enzyme, they're going to block norepinephrine, serotonin, and the dopaminergic pathways. And then postsynaptically, we have um, other receptors, serotonin and norepinephrine receptors, that are also acted on um, by medications, specifically mirtazapine, nifazidone, and trazodone. And all of these get looked at in a pharmacodynamic um, model for pharmacogenetics. So antidepressants have antagonistic effects at other receptors, like the serotonin 2 and 3 receptors, um, often abbreviated HTR2 and 3, um, alpha 1 and 2 receptors, histamine receptors, and cholinergic receptors. I'm sure everyone remembers this from pharmacy school. Um, and it's usually the side effects that we see that are related to these receptors. So a lot of the pharmacogenetic variants um, within these receptors um, are the focus of the, the tolerance and the, and the side effect um, literature. So to start off with today, you know, serotonin um, is by far and away the um, neurotransmitter system that is primarily looked at when we're talking about pharmacodynamic and or pharmacodynamic genetic studies related to antidepressant response. But there are a lot of, a lot of other areas. Uh, tryptophan hydroxase, we're going to talk about monoamine oxidase, the G protein, um, as well as brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Some of these are physiologic in, in regards to serotonin neurotransmission. Um, and then some of them also have to do um, with the neurobiology of depression itself um, and may affect antidepressant response. So the first one we're going to talk about is the serotonin transporter, and this by far has been the most studied when we're looking at response and depression. The serotonin transporter has several different abbreviations, the SLC6A4, the 5-HTTLPR. There's also SERT-PR um, is another way of abbreviating it, and um, all, all of them are constantly used in the literature. Um, what this is, it's, it's not a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a 44 base pair insertion or deletion um, that actually affects the serotonin transporter expression. And so um, existence of the 44 base pair insertion results in what is called a long allele or a long variant and a short variant. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit later physiologically what uh, happens as a result of the long and short and how it is related to depression. There's also another uh, variant, the variable number of tandem repeats, which is an intron 2. This hasn't um, gotten a lot of attention within the depression literature, um, but lately I've noticed it's more and more in the literature. People are, are looking at it a little bit closer. And this results in um, a, a tandem repeat, so, um, and it either contains a 9, 10, or 12 copies of a 16 to 17 base pair repeat. And so oftentimes in the literature, you'll see the STIN2.9 um, or an STIN2.9 STIN slash STIN2.10. Um, and that means someone would be heterozygous having a, a one copy of the 9 and one, one copy of the 10 allele repeat. The serotonin 1A and 2A receptors have also been uh, pretty extensively looked at um, within the depressant literature in terms of response. For the 1A receptor, there's a variant that's in the promoter region, the 1019 C to G variant. And as we, as we look at these, you'll see, let me see if I can get my highlight tool. <coughs> right here, 
highlighted here. Um, anything that's a, a single nucleotide polymorphism is going to have an RS number, and it's, it's really the only standardization that we have right now. Um, although it is very confusing because it's not very intuitive, um, when you think about serotonin 1A and the 1019 variant, to then think about the 6 RS6295. And a lot of these get very, very long and very difficult to remember. So um, oftentimes, if you're doing a lit search for a very specific um, variant, um, you need to do it in several different ways, looking for the common name as well as, as the, the dbSNP name. Um, for this variant, um, presence of the G allele results in reduced serotonergic neurotransmission, which would be why um, people would be interested in it in terms of antidepressant response. Um, more commonly, the serotonin 2A receptors have been looked at. There's two variants um, that are most commonly looked at, the 102C to T, or T to C, and then the 1438A to G. These two are highly linked. Um, one of them is, is in the promoter region, the 1438, and so oftentimes um, people will just look for the 1438 knowing that these two are so highly linked that if you, that if you genotype for one, you're probably going to be genotyping um, for the other. Um, tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and tryptophan hydroxylase 2 are other targets that have been looked at in response to depression. Um, it's, it's interesting because tryptophan hydroxylase um, is the enzyme that's responsible for forming serotonin. Um, the two isoforms are 1 and 2, and the TPH1 is primarily located in peripheral organs like the gut, the spleen, thymus, and somewhat in the brain. But, but actually, for a lot of the studies, TPH1 has been looked at more than TPH2, where TPH2 is actually located within the brain, um, but it hasn't really been until recently that people have started looking at that. Um, TPH1 has higher affinity for tryptophan than TPH2, um, and so that's why it's um, been looked at in terms of antidepressant response and looking at, at serotonin turnover. So for TPH2, um, there's two non-synonymous SNPs, meaning that they result in an amino acid change, and these result in about an 80% loss of serotonin production. Um, and then there's other three other variants that don't really have a common name associated with it, and they've all been marginally associated with fluvoxamine response. Um, other ones that have looked at for response in depression, uh, monamine oxidase A, um, the G uh, second messenger uh, systems, the G coupled protein, um, as well as growth factors. And, and as I'm sure you all know, monamine oxidase is responsible for serotonin. Um, as well as the other neurotransmitters, the catabolism of those neurotransmitters. There's a variable number of tandem repeats that's located in it. People either have 3.5 or 4 copies, and if they have those, they're trans, uh, they find that uh, transcription for the gene is between two to times um, more efficient than if people have uh, a three-copy repeat um, of the gene. Um, there have been very, very few studies that have been done with MD. Uh, with MDD and only one study showed better treatment response um, with the three copy, and it was an Asian female, so it's a, pr a pretty selective group. Um, the second messenger sig signaling, the G proteins, um, are really garnering a lot of attention now, and it's this um, 825C to T variant that really uh, people are looking at. Uh, presence of the T allele is is about is found in about 30% of the populations, while in Asian populations, it's around 50%, and the T allele has been associated with better response to various classes of antidepressants, although the results have not been that consistent. And then brain-derived neurotropic factor is um, a really hot topic within psychiatry in general. Um, it is a growth factor, um, and the secretion and trafficking of the BDNF is regulated by this VAL66MET uh, variant. <coughs> Excuse me. There's been at least five different studies that have examined the relationship between this variant and antidepressant response, and this uh, Cato and Soretti put uh, together a meta-analysis and found that presence of the meta allele was associated with greater antidepressant response, um, and it has an odds ratio of about 1.63. And BDNF is actually um, partly involved in glucocorticoid metabolism. Um, as well as just being an overall growth factor for the brain, and so that would make sense, and um, you can understand why people would want to look at that. 
In terms of the functional effect of these, for the serotonin transporter, I talked about the L allele um, having greater expression. What we usually see is that it has twice um, the serotonin transporter expression than the S allele. And so the thought then is that if people have more serotonin transporters on which the medication can work, that might be why there's greater um, antidepressant efficacy in people that have um, the L allele or the LL, LL genotype. Um, there's kind of this, it's, it's been coined a flip-flop phenomenon. I'll, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later as we, as we talk about um, some of the work that's been done. But um, where a, the Asian population, um, it's been reported in smaller case studies that the S allele is actually associated um, with greater antidepressant response, although I think that the flip-flop phenomenon is, is kind of going away and people aren't seeing that as much anymore. The STIN2 um, can also affect a serotonin transporter transmission, um, and it's primarily synergistic um, with the serotonin transporter uh, or the CERT PR uh, variant. Um, the L allele for the transporter is present about 50 to 60 percent of the Caucasian population, about 30 to 40 percent of the Asian populations, which may also be why you see kind of that flip-flop phenomena. And for the STIN2, the 10 and 12 alleles um, have a frequency of about 10 to 20 percent and they're much higher, 80 to 90 percent, within the Asian population. And so there, there are some differences there in terms of response. Um, I'm not going to go a whole lot into, into these, but um, you know, the serotonin 1A, the, the 1019 C to G variant, the G allele has reduced serotonergic neurotransmission, and so that's why that's been looked at. For the 2A, you have the 1438A to G, which has been associated with significantly increased promoter activity compared to the G allele, um, although that's not really been confirmed and studies are still conflicting. Um, about 50% of Caucasians and 21% of Asians will have the G allele of the serotonin 1A receptor gene, and about 50% of the population are going to have the G allele um, for the serotonin 2A receptor. For tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and 2, um, for, trypt for TPH1, both the 1218 and the 779 um, variants are in strong linkage disequilibrium, meaning that if you have a C at the 779, you most likely have a C um, at the 28 variant. Um, we don't really know the functional consequences of, of these and, and what they mean in terms of antidepressant response. Um, but given the location, it, it may affect um, promoter expression. And as I said previously, the TPH2, um, the ARG allele has a 80% decrease in serotonin production um, for the 1463, and the 447 ARG variant has about a 55% uh, reduction in serotonin um, production. And then the other three as well have also been associated with the antidepressant response. So they may be more functional and more relevant to antidepressant pharmacogenetics. Um, there's a lot in this slide, but I think what you just kind of want to get out is um, the differences. The monoamine oxidase has the variable number of tandem repeats that we already talked about. The three and a half and four repeats are longer and are felt to be more functional than those that are the three to five. Um, the serotonin, the G protein, it's the 825 C to T variant that's been looked at. And then for BDNF, it's the 66 um, Valmet variant that's, that's primarily been looked at. Um, for the BTNR, most commonly you see the four and the three repeats um, within the population. For the, uh, for the G protein, it's primarily the T allele that's most common. And then for BDNF, um, the A or the meta allele is only present in about 20% of populations, but about 60% of Asian populations. So there's some racial differences there. So kind of switching gears now to looking at um, pharmacokinetics and, and how pharmacogenomics may affect the pharmacokinetics of antidepressants. Like I said previously, most of this literature really focuses on the cytochrome P450 enzymes since they are primarily responsible for antidepressant metabolism. We really have the most information about these. Um, we know they're located in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in the liver, um, but they're also in the intestinal wall, kidney, the nasal and lung and, and brain epithelium. And, and there's a lot of questions about um, where the literature is going in terms of CNS effects 
uh, cytochrome P450 because uh, the research in that is really hampered in the fact that in order to do that, you, uh, to, to look at this, you really need a brain sample, and most people are not really willing to give you a brain sample um, as part of your research project. So we may never fully know um, the, the, the CNS effects of 2D6 or of the P450s. So as you look at this, you can see, and I'm sure all of you know, that P450s are highly involved in drug metabolism, 3A4 being the most common, um, 2D6 following that. And that uh, the thing that when I give this lecture to students here, um, the thing that they're often most surprised by is that these actually the numbers and the letters actually mean something. And so if you look at the P450 nomenclature, the, those um, that the CYPs are the cytochrome P450s, but then if you have the three, um, then you're talking about the same family. So CYP3 is a family, CYP2 is a family, CYP1 is a family. Um, and then as you go the step further um, and you start looking at the subfamily, that's the letter that is involved with it. So um, CYP2D, um, all the, anything that has a CYP2D um, are about 50 percent, 55 percent um, very similar in their DNA sequence um, versus 2C9 and 2C19, then those two, since they're both 2Cs, they would be 55% um, analogous to each other, where 2D6 and 2C19 would only be about 40% um, analogous to each other in sequence homology. And then your specific gene product is the number that's actually at the end. So the name actually uh, does mean something, and you can get from there um, which ones kind of go together. So this is another quick um, table, too. Um, Dave Flockhart, who is at the Indiana School of Medicine, has one of the most comprehensive tables on um, P450 substrates, <coughs> inhibitors, inducers. And uh, the web link that's um, on the slide is, is the place to go if you want to take a look at that. And it's, it's constantly updated um, since he has made a, a research career out of studying P450. Um, substrates, inhibitors, and inducers. But you can see here, in terms of the psych medications, the psych medications are highly metabolized um, by, the, by the P450 system. It's not just 2D6, although 2D6 is a lot of the medications. Uh, 2C19 is involved. 2B6 is involved for bupropion. 1A2 is also involved, um, fluvoxamine probably being the most well-known. Um, 1A2 substrate, and then 3A4 is also involved with some of the older medications um, as well. So if you look at this table, you can partly predict drug interactions. If you know that you have another drug and that drug inhibits one of the P450s, you can kind of predict what the drug interactions would be or if it was an inducer of one of those, um, and that can help guide your medication choice. Um, this is a table that kind of graphically represents the antidepressant inhibitors. Um, and you can see on the top, there's 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4, and then some um, medications listed to the, to the left in the, on the kind of y-axis. This is by no means um, comprehensive, and so going to David Flockhart's uh, website is probably the best way to get the most comprehensive um, and up-to-date information. But as you, as you look at it here, um, you can see, um, you know, three stars means that it's a greater inhibitor here. Um, and what we kind of want to get from this is, you know, we looked on the previous page that paroxetine was a 2D6 substrate, and so now we see here that bupropion is actually a 2D6 inhibitor. And it's, it's not that strong of an inhibitor, although there are reports that it's an extremely strong inhibitor, so that's kind of controversial. But if someone was an intermediate metabolizer, um, they don't have as much of 2D6 as someone who's an extensive metabolizer. And so just from that alone, it wouldn't need to be a really strong inhibitor to get the sort of drug interaction that we had at the beginning of the case. So in looking at 2D6 specifically in pharmacokinetic candidates um, for these studies, you know, I'm sure many of you know 2D6 is polymorphic, meaning that it exists in different forms. So people can have high activity, people can have low activity, people can have super high activity, and they can have no activity. Um, the different forms really result in different abilities um, to metabolize substrates for this drug. 
Um, and what people end up being classified as are ultra-rapid metabolizers, rapid or extensive metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, and poor metabolizers. And 2D6 is a drug or is an enzyme that has a tremendous number of genetic variants that are associated with it that result in metabolic differences. Um, there, uh, I think coming up, there's a web page that you can go to, um, the SIP alleles. I think that's on one of the, it's in the notes um, on page 37 if you, if you want to go to it. Um, but that has a list of all of the different variants. And probably about 10 years ago, um, the, a group got together and made common nomenclature for 2D6 because everyone was talking about the ABC variants, and then it ended up being all these other different variants, and people were getting confused, and so now the nomenclature is, is all standardized. But um, like I said, that's, that's the numbers that you see after, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, um, specify which variant is that we're talking about. So to kind of give you background on this, and I'm sure you all know this, but in order for someone to be a poor metabolizer, you need two copies of the gene. And so people that only have one copy of the of the poor metabolizer gene or people that uh, or the no function gene are then immediate metabolizers. You can also get uh, kind of an intermediate metabolizer if someone has a lower functionality. Um, if someone has a lower functionality um, variant that re results in some reduced activity, but there's a little bit if they have two copies of that, that can also uh, result in um, in someone being an intermediate metabolizer. Um, in Caucasians, there's the STAR4 variant that causes a splice defect. And um, what happens is that there's no CYP2D6 enzyme formed. Um, and so that's the most common variant um, causing the poor metabolizer phenotype in this population. Other important variants are the STAR10, the STAR17, and STAR41. Um, the STAR4 variant that I talked about being so prevalent in the Caucasian population is almost absent from the Chinese population. Um, and it's the STAR10 variant in the Chinese population that results in the poor metabolizer phenotype. It has a frequency of about 50%. Um, the African uh, populations, the STAR17 variant is, is primarily responsible for the poor metabolizer phenotype. And so you can see, although the, there's differences in the percentage of um, for metabolizers with different racial groups, it, it is also due to uh, different variants being the cause um, of the poor metabolizer phenotype. So I got a note about uh, notes on page 17. So I don't know if I can do this or not. I don't think I can do it. The website, if, if you guys no. are interested in writing it down, it's um, www dot cyp alleles dot ki dot se forward slash cyp 2d6 dot htm So now we're going to go back, talk a little bit more. Like I said, Caucasians, there's about 5 to 10 percent of the Caucasian population that completely lack the 2D6 enzyme. And so they're actually, you know, you really don't have to worry about 2D6 drug interactions because they can't handle the medications anyways. Um, and so they're ones that hopefully are going to have dosage reduction before they're even put on any medication. Um, for them, uh, the poor metabolizer phenotype is really seen with the 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6 um, um, alleles. And the 3 to 4 really constitute about 75% of the alleles responsible for poor metabolizer phenotype within this group. And like I just said previously, um, in the Asian population, it's really the star 10 allele that's associated with, with the poor metabolizer phenotype. And then in African population, it's the star 17. Um, so people can also exhibit in, in uh, an ultra metabolizer phenotype. Um, and most people that have these variants, it results in multiple copies of 2D6. And what happens um, is that what the functional allele is fused head to tail. And so people can have 13, 26 um, copies of um, this, um, of the star 1 or the star 2 allele. 
Um, and that's what the end down here is for as you look at the slide, um, where you see CYP2D6 star 1 times 12. <laughs> Excuse me, meaning that someone had 12 copies of the genes. It occurs, um, it occurs in about 2% of the Caucasian and the African American population, so it's, it's not um, in a large percentage of, of the populations. But what it results in is people that are just have the ability to really uh, metabolize these drugs very, very quickly, and so they may need a dosage that's two to three times the regular dose. Um, they may also have a higher percentage of metabolites since they have this great capacity to create those metabolites. And so if you have a drug that has side effects associated with the metabolites, then um, you may need to watch that um, because they're going to have metabolite accumulation. Um, gene duplication can also occur sometimes with the non-functional alleles, um, but, and that would also result in the poor metabolizer phenotype. So this graph shows the population prevalence um, associated um, with, uh, with different P450s as I point this out to you. So this is 2C9 right here. These are the 2D6 ones right here. Um, these are 3A4 and then 1A2 right here. I think I can do this. Yep, erases it. And so there's important things to, to point out because really what we're looking at is we're looking at the, the racial or the ethnic differences associated with 2D6. So as we look at 2C9, you can see, you know, the, the 2 and the 3 are the most common um, ones within the Caucasians. Um, and then the Asians, it's really the star 3 allele that's associated with kind of the poor metabolizer phenotype. In the Caucasian or population here for 2D6, you can see it's really the 4 and the 5, and we already talked about that. Over 75% of poor metabolizers are because of the 4 to 5, and then the 10 being in the Asian population, and then here um, the 17 uh, being more common in the African American populations. And then lastly, we're looking at the 3A4. You can see there are some differences, the, the 1B in Caucasians, but it's much, much higher in African Americans. Excuse me. And then for 1A2, um, you know, Caucasians have a greater um, of the 1F um, variant um, versus African Americans and Asians, and so that would be a case where you just wouldn't, um, you would, you would see differences, um, racial differences associated with metabolizer status for 1A2. Um, so as we look at, at the research that's really been done in terms of the clinical relevance of all this information that I just kind of uh, threw at you, um, the serotonin transporter is probably the most studied in terms of antidepressant response. Um, and recently, um, Alexander Soretti put together a meta-analysis that looked at 15 studies that had about 1,400 patients, and they actually had some a priori criteria as they looked at this. They wanted to look at remission, people having a hand be less than seven. They wanted to look at response, people that had a reduction in their score by about 50%. Because if you start with a HAMD score greater than 20, say you start at 25, if you have a 50% reduction, you're going to be around 12 and 13, which is still going to have, mean you have depressive symptoms. And then they also looked at four-week response rate because all of these studies had different endpoints. They were not all at four weeks, um, but they all had four-week uh, time points. And so that was the one um, common feature among all of them, so they looked at that, and they're also looking at um, rates of response because it's been suggested that the L variant may be associated with greater um, response or a quicker response to antidepressant medications. They um, compared the genotypes in, in basically two different ways. Um, they looked at people that had the LL genotype versus those that just carried one copy of the S allele, so that would be the LS people and the SS people. And then they also reversed it, and they looked at the SS people versus those that had one copy of the L allele for the LS or the LL people. And then they, they examined the group as a whole, and then they also split it out into a Caucasian and an Asian analysis, since I talked about before that flip-flop phenomenon, where it's been thought that Asian populations um, have a completely different response. 
What they found was actually fairly interesting. So what this table is here is, is a summary of their results. So this is the remission criteria, which is a HAMD less than and then 7, the response, which is a 50% decrease, and then the four-week response. Um, there's the total group here, these two columns, because I said they, they analyzed it two different ways, the Caucasian group here and the Asian group here. <clears throat> and what you really see is that presence of the L allele resulted in a significant um, re uh, increase in remission, um, and that presence of the LL genotype um, resulted in significant increase in response as well as four-week response for the group overall. And then you see some similarities with the Caucasian group where they had the L allele carriers were associated with remission, and then the LL genotype was associated with response, although not as, not as strong. Um, these are odds ratios that are presented here. And in, then in the Asian population, they didn't find anything with remission, but they did find that the LL genotype was associated um, with um, response as well as four-week response. And so this kind of really is, is the world's literature on uh, the serotonin um, variant and what it means for antidepressant response. Um, they also looked at their data to see how much of an effect the um, LL or the, the 5-HTTLPR variant had. And what they basically found is that presence of or this variant actually only accounts for about 15% of the variants that we see in antidepressant response, which is amazingly small. Um, but um, this really is some of the, the best literature and some of the strongest literature that we have in terms of antidepressant response. Excuse me. So um, this group then went on and did a different meta-analysis looking at eight different genes that have all kind of been pointed out, and these are the ones that we've been talking about. And um, just to summarize this very quickly, they looked at the serotonin transporter, the serotonin 1A receptor, 2A receptor, um, the TPH1, uh, the G proteins, BDNF, uh, serotonin 3, um, a and then also the 3B, and they only found that the serotonin, um, the, the, the TPH, tryptophan hydroxylase 1, and BDNF variants were associated with response. Um, interestingly, though, as you look at this, you see these, you know, these, these have fairly impressive p-values, but if you take into account that they really need to correct for multiple comparisons, none of the variants really um, were able to withstand this kind of test. And so, um, what they really needed was a much larger sample size um, to show the effect of, of these variants because their true effect is pretty small. Um, switching gears a little bit, you know, we've talked a lot about um, antidepressant response, and I, and I said when we started off this webinar that um, Side effects is really where a lot of the work has been done as well, and I think this is because it's, it's a little bit easier to measure some of the side effects or document, do people have these side effects, do they not? And so to kind of summarize up the literature that, that in terms of antidepressant um, side effects, there, there hasn't been a lot done, but, but there's been a fair amount that we can kind of group them. So looking at antidepressant intolerance, um, and the one that's been looked at the most has been the serotonin transporter. 2D6 has been looked at, as well as the 2A receptor. Um, several groups have looked, or uh, one group has looked at um, SSRI-associated sexual dysfunction found variants within the 2A receptor, as well as the serotonin transporter um, being involved in uh, sexual dysfunction. And, and that might also be something, as, as you present your case and you bring this up, that might be something that the students suggest testing for, um, which is, is certainly um, a viable option as, as there are some tests available for looking primarily at the serotonin transporter, but not necessarily the 2A receptor. And then looking at SSRI nausea and vomiting, 2D6, and then uh, 2A variants have been, have been looked at that, looked in, uh, in those studies as well. Um, this, is, this is a study um, that I thought was kind of interesting where they looked at intermediate metabolizers, and so this kind of goes along with the whole intermediate metabolizer theme. Um, but this was um, 30, or, uh, 365 people that were inpatients and they were treated for depression. And they, um, they kind of back, went back and looked at them. Um, as part of their treatment, they received this DOTS, which is the Dosage Record and Treatment Emergent Symptoms Scale. 
Um, and I don't, I don't know a whole lot about this scale, but I, I was able to figure out from the article that a higher score um, results in a um, meaning that you have more side effects um, from your medications. And they also use the clinical global impression scale, um, which is kind of a nebulous scale where people just say they're doing better, they're not doing better, or they're. Um, but what they did is, is they, they looked at these people that were taking these medications, they were kind of um, treated in, a, in an open label. They went back and genotyped them, and they found that 30% of them were receiving a 2D6 substrate. <clears throat> and of this 30%, 13 of them were poor metabolizers, and 36% of them were, were intermediate metabolizers. And they compared this 30% of subjects um, and found that in those that were genetically poor metabolizers, their DOTE score was statistically significantly higher than those that were not poor metabolizers. And so these were people that were probably complaining of a lot of side effects, being told that, oh, these side effects will go away with time, when in actuality they probably had higher blood levels um, because they were not metabolizing the drugs as well. Um, they, they looked at the, the CGI and looked at the intermediate metabolizers, and they found that um, in the intermediate metabolizers that were treated with 2D6 drugs, 7% of them um, had, a, had a good rating on the clinical global impression scale, and 25%, um, a 25% rate was seen in people that were treated with other medications. And so once again, speaking to the fact that these patients probably were having a lot of side effects that were being dismissed um, when there was a physiologic reason why they were having it. They also stratified people as to whether or not they were receiving a dosage of, a med of the medications that were above the population mean or below the population mean. And the EMs here are in the light blue in the front, and the IMs here are in the darker blue in the back. And for those that were receiving a dose that was less than a population mean, there really was no difference in those that were experiencing marked or moderate side effects. But in those that were having a higher dose, greater than the population mean, you can see here that the extensive metabolizers um, only had about a 10% um, uh, incidence of side effects versus close to 70% incidence of side effects in those that were intermediate metabolizers. Um, and also here, too, this, this line is a little bit light, so I hope you can see it. Um, this is um, looking at poor metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, extensive metabolizers, and ultra-rapid metabolizers. And you can see here that um, this group here wasn't taking any 2D6 medications. Um, and so the percentage of people that had marked or moderate side effects was very low. In those that were taking the 2D6 medications, which is the blue lines here, the poor metabolizers, 100% of them um, had marked or moderate side effects compared to 40% of the intermediate metabolizers, 20% um, of, the, of the extensive metabolizers, and 20-30% you know, of the ultra-rapid metabolizers were, getting, were receiving side effects. So this group down here obviously not metabolizing the drug as well and experiencing significant side effects. And then one last slide that goes along with this. This is um, from a study uh, or a, by a, a manuscript um, from uh, Kirschheiner, um, who has done a lot of work on 2D6 and dosing adjustments. We do not have studies that say that if you are a 2D6 poor metabolizer and you are treated with this dose and this drug, um, that your outcome is necessarily going to be better. We just don't have those sort of, uh, you know, T2, T3 translational sort of research projects. And so this group really has looked at kind of percent reductions in metabolism based on 2D6 um, and then made some dosing recommendations. So these, are, these dosing recommendations are basically um, based on reduction in enzyme being present in the liver and not necessarily in outcomes. But you can see here for people that are the light blue in the front, the poor metabolizers, um, th this is the, on the y-axis here is the percent of dosage adjustment. They need about a 60% reduction um, in dosage or a 40% reduction in dosage. Um, those that are intermediate metabolizers here really don't need a dosage adjustment. Extensive metabolizers. Um, don't really need a dosage adjustment either, and then um, ultra-rapid metabolizers need actually an increase where this is up to 150% of the usual dose. And I should say the intermediate people here are more around 80%, so they need, should need about a 20% 
um, reduction, and this is for paroxetine, venlafaxine, and nortriptyline, all of which are 2 to 6 substrates. So I presented you a lot of information about 2D6, how it's genetically regulated. Um, the question is, how do we actually implement this into the clinic? Where does someone go to get these tests? So as of right now, there aren't any FDA-approved tests for any of the pharmacodynamic targets that we talked about for the serotonin um, transporter, for the 2A receptor, for BDNF, for tryptophan hydroxylase, monoamine oxidase. There are no FDA-approved tests, although there are um, some companies out there that are available to offer these um, to clients. Um, oftentimes this can be done in concert with your prescriber, um, and oftentimes it can be done um, outside your prescriber um, if people are willing to pay cash, have an internet connection, um, and getting reimbursement for these um, is completely unknown, so that would be something someone would have to figure out with their insurance company. There are several FDA-approved pharmacogenomic tests. Um, one is for 2D6, and it also includes 2C19. Um, despite the fact that we actually have this test, it often doesn't get used clinically because there's still debate as to whether or not um, it's going to make a difference in the treatment of patients. I think we're, we're closer than we've ever been, um, although it's, it's, like I said, it's still highly debated. There's problems concerning uh, use of these tests also because uh, they can be fairly expensive. They range between a couple hundred dollars to five, six, seven hundred dollars, depending on what it is that you're getting. Um, providers are often not familiar with the results of the tests, although I think companies, as more and more companies are springing up, they're finding out that the easier they can make it for the prescriber or the provider to understand, the more likely they're going to recommend people get the testing. Um, and so I think that's changing a little bit too. Reimbursement tends to be the biggest obstacle I think that we have right now in terms of actually using these in the clinic. I know some uh, insurance companies have a rule that they have to pay for any FDA approved test and thus um, they may pay for it. Um, other companies um, I know are unwilling to, to pay for them at all unless there's a, a dire need or or there's uh, a long justification letter as, as to why this was clinically necessary. So there are tests available out there. We're just unfortunately not really using them um, in clinical practice. <coughs> there's also um, uh, some testing recommendations out there, and there was the evaluation of genomic applications in practice and prevention uh, had a working group that looked at the literature. Now, granted, this is fairly old. This is 2007. Um, but they, their conclusion really was that there was a, there's a paucity of good quality data addressing the question of whether testing for two, uh, P450 polymorphism in adults entering SSRI treatment for non-psychotic depression leads to improvement in outcomes, um, or whether testing results are useful in medical, personal, and public health decision making. And so when this came out, I got asked a lot of questions of this because everybody took this as this working group was saying, do not test. And I take a little bit different viewpoint on this. I would say that this group just says there's, we need more data, um, but it does not say do not test. And I think in uh, the appropriate patients, testing is very important, and it can help really guide therapy and save a lot of time and a lot of side effects and medication uh, non-response in patients. So <clears throat> like I said, oftentimes you'll hear that the working group said that you should not test people, and, and I, would, I would take issue with that and say that it, it doesn't say that you shouldn't test, it just says that we don't really have data, strong data to, to um, support the testing and that we need more work in this area. So, you know, based on these guidelines, uh, testing is not for everyone. Uh, like I said, the guidelines don't preclude pharmacogenetic testing in the clinical practice and that there may be situations um, where it would be more appropriate, but we, but we do need research. So now that we've kind of done that, we're going to go back to our case. Um, you know, and as the case pointed out, knowing that the 2D6 genotype, knowing that uh, information before starting treatment uh, would potentially allow for greater success in treating her depression. Um, you know, she did really, really great on the paroxetine, and so it could have been that lowering the dose of paroxetine would have been more effective. Um, for um, lowering her side effects. 20 milligrams is a standard dose, and I think most people would be very uncomfortable lowering that dose unless they knew um, that someone was an intermediate metabolizer and that that would probably be clinically okay. Um, 
the bupropion was a potent inhibitor of 2D6, which is what caused a lot of the problems. And so because she didn't have as much 2D6 to overcome that, that's where you see the effect. And so knowing she was an intermediate metabolizer might actually prevent uh, bupropion from being prescribed. It also would have prevented the, potentially prevented the failed trial um, with the venlafaxine, um, as that was not effective. And it, it may, knowing that from the information, may have um, caused the prescriber to give her uh, Cytalopram, um, which is not metabolized by 2D6, and then um, you know weeks and weeks. We're talking well, actually more months and months of, of time would have not gone by, and she should could have been successfully treated um, without having these side effects. So those are the things that you kind of want to get out as you, as you talk about this case um, and kind of um, talk to the students about why she may have had those and, and what it actually would mean um, clinically in the end as you go on. So to kind of summarize then, pharmacogenetic testing as it relates to the treatment of depression is, can be loosely based pharmacodynamically versus pharmacokinetically. The serotonin transporter is the one that we have the most information on pharmacodynamically, and 2D6 is, is the enzyme for the pharmacokinetic, um, uh, pharmacokinetic effects. The serotonin transporter uh, is felt to explain about 15% of the variants that we see in antidepressant response. Um, it's the most studied, and we have the most consistent findings across all um, studies related to antidepressant response. Um, but still, conclusively, um, people are not using it uh, clinically, although there are some tests available. 2D6 is an isoenzyme that's responsible for metabolism of up to 20% of medications, and it's most studied within psychiatry because most of the medications that we have are metabolized by 2D6. Um, for antidepressants, very few are not really metabolized by 2D6, and many also inhibit the enzyme. Thus, there are a lot of drug interactions related to 2D6, and when you add on the pharmacogenetics of that, you often can get a very confusing picture, and knowing that genetic information then can be very, very helpful. Uh, testing for 2D6 um, is, is commercially available. Uh, it's not feasible everywhere, and it's not routinely done. There are some um, uh, institutions within the country that do routinely test everyone, although uh, knowing their patient makeup, I think that they may not be um, extrap well, you might not be able to extrapolate their practice to everywhere. Um, the e EGAPP panel was um, unable to find uh, a lot of strong data to support its use clinically, but they did not refute its use um, clinically, which is important to remember. Um, while 2D6 testing is important in determining the side effects, there are other pharmacodynamic targets that also need to be considered. Um, and so it may not be the only answer, but it may be part of the puzzle. And with that, I want to conclude. Um, I wanted to thank the reviewers and the editorial staff. Um, Kelly Lee was the primary reviewer and the editor, as well as uh, Grace Quo and Sarah McBain um, were reviewers and associate edi editors, and then assistant editors, Karina Holly and then Ashley Toe. And with that, the next couple slides have some references um, on them, and I think that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellingrod, for that great presentation. Um, I just want to have a few uh, last comments. Uh, we hope this information is helpful as you translate pharmacogenomic evidence into practice. If you have any questions or comments about this presentation or about our pharmacogenetic program, please email us at pharmacogenomics at ucsd.edu. The pharmacogenetic team is here. Uh, we would like to acknowledge, the, again, the funding agency, CDC, for, and, and all the consultants and reviewers for making these slides available. Just want to highlight the webinar dates that have been completed thus far. You can see that there are a variety of topics, and all of these materials are currently available on our website. Just a note about our website. We are having some technical issues regarding our website uh, that we should be up and running hopefully by uh, next week. We are in touch with the programmers at this time. So uh, we apologize for not uh, making these slides available today uh, before the webinar. We have completed today Psychiatry 1, a Depression, and we have one um, additional webinar, our last webinar on asthma that will be coming up in November 2nd from 10 to 12 p.m. If you have not registered for this webinar already, please um, email us at pharmacogenomics at ucsd.edu.
you will be asked to complete a post-training survey based on your webinar attendance, uh, which will evaluate knowledge, attitudes, and assess self-efficacy of the pharmacogenomics information. And all these surveys will be uh, uh, mailed to all the participants who have uh, attended all our webinars in November 2010. So at this time, I'd like to unmute the audience so that we can begin the question and answer session. The conference has been unmuted. Okay, so um, one co uh, question that came up um, from the chat uh, that I'll start off with that. Uh, in today's paper, researchers discovered a protein 11 that they feel can be used for gene therapy rather than serotonin medications. And the question was, are drug companies looking at protein P11? Am I supposed to answer that? <laughs> I don't know. I was just quickly looking through that. I, um, it was done in mice. Uh, okay. so, um, and it was from, I'm trying to remember what institution. This is New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, okay. Yeah, I haven't Michael, seen that. So. Dr. Caplet. So, I, it, yeah, it was done in, um, uh, it was done in mice, and they kind of looked at whether they were um, willing to fight, <laughs> fight against the whatever what they were doing to the mice. <laughs> so, uh, which kind of, if they lacked the protein, then um, then they uh, they kind of displayed symptoms of depression. If they and actually they gave the gene um, protein. And they acted a little bit better, so that's what they showed. It's kind of a learned helplessness model. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I didn't quite get into all the <laughs> nitty gritty of the um, actual what, how they detected the depression, but yeah, it was, it was something like that. But I, I just, yeah, I just saw it today. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't think I can comment on that. I, I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. I, I need to look at that, look at the paper. But I think mm -hmm. that would be very exciting. Yeah, so. yeah. Any other questions from the audience? to Dr. Ellingrod. This is Ron Reed from uh, UBC. I was just wondering about um, whether uh, uh, the, the transporters are actually a, a pharmacodynamic or a pharmacokinetic effect. Um, I th you know, <clears throat> I just got this question from my students here, and it's, it's really hard to explain um, because it is so blurred. I think whether it's a pharmacodynamic or a pharmacokinetic, I guess my personal opinion is I view it as more of a pharmacodynamic effect because it's not changing any of the pharmacokinetics of the drug. So well, in, in, in fact, a transporter would change the pharmacokinetics of a drug if the, if the transporter didn't allow the drug to get to where it was being metabolized. Well, see, it doesn't. So, Oh, so the serotonin transporter has nothing to do with... Um, where the drug needs to go. It's the pharmacologic action of where the drug, of, of the drug. It's the target of the drug. So if it's, uh, if it's a, a, a drug transporter such as P-glycoprotein, then it would be a pharmacokinetic drug interaction. But the serotonin transporter itself is actually the target of the, of the SSRIs. And so in that sense, it's more of a pharmacology drug action sort of. That, that terrifies me. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. And again, if you have any questions about the uh, presentation, please feel free to email us, and we'll relay the uh, message to Dr. Ellingrod as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Vicki, if you could. Thank you. Please stand by.